1 Corinthians chapter 9, as we make our way through the entire Bible in terms of uh, Genesis to Revelation, we're in 1 Corinthians 9, making our way through the book of 1 Corinthians. Based on what we see in the news today, it might be easy to think that the most important thing in life is to preserve your rights. I mean, our rights and our freedoms are at the core of who we are as a nation. We have the Declaration of Independence, which declares that God has given us certain rights, and those rights are meant to be protected by government. And then on top of that, we have this thing called the Bill of Rights, the first 10, um, the 10 amendments to the Constitution. Did you know that two years after the new American government went into effect, the Bill of Rights was added as the first 10 amendments to the Constitution? See, it wasn't part of the original Constitution. They felt like the, the Constitution itself and the Declaration of Independence would be enough to guarantee freedoms. But then when they brought the Constitution, there were those like Patrick Henry that argued that it needed to lay out specifically what rights. And those rights that we know of are the right to freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom to gather. Uh, you know those rights. That's the Bill of Rights. So Congress discussed about 200 proposals for amendments before it finally presented the 10 to the states for approval. And these were ratified in 1791. So daily, now as you watch the news, as we have discussions with people, it's a daily conversation about the discussion of people's rights in our day and age. We're discussing gay rights. We're discussing women's rights. We're discussing gun rights. We're discussing reproductive rights. And we're discussing parental rights. Now, I don't know how many of you are of my generation, but in 1986, I was introduced to a group of three political activists, otherwise known as the Beastie Boys. Anybody around during that day? You, those of you that laugh know exactly who I'm talking about. We were subject to all of that nonsense in the 80s. But the Beastie Boys told me that I had a right, I had to fight for my right to do what? Now, I didn't know I had a right to party, but they told me I had a right to party. What they didn't tell their generation was that if you happen to get arrested for underage drinking while you're partying, you also have the right to remain silent. <laughs> you have the right to an attorney. That's called Miranda's rights. <laughs> Chapters 8 and 9 of 1 Corinthians discuss another right. And Paul would say this right is possibly the most important of all of our rights and absolutely essential for a Christian and that is the right to surrender your rights for the sake of loving somebody else. Now, again, oftentimes the problems that we are subject to with oppressiveness is when our rights are taken from us. So Paul is not suggesting in it for a second that God wants to take our rights from us. Far, the, far from that. The opposite of that is true. We are free in Christ. We have liberty. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. But part of that liberty is the liberty to say, I choose not to engage in something if it's going to be harmful to you. Again, we're not talking about uh, something that just simply offends somebody else. How in the world can we live a day nowadays without offending somebody? You can't get up in the morning and sneeze and not offend somebody. And that would be a very tragic and difficult way to live. But what Paul is talking about is not when someone sees me do something that they don't like and they're offended by it. The problem that Paul has addressed there in chapter 8 was that when something I do, when me maintaining a right I have comes into conflict with you maintaining a right and a conviction that you have. And I hope you see the difference, that my rights should never force you to violate your rights. If you look at the end of chapter 10, Paul will tell you exactly where he is going with all of this. Look at verse 23 of chapter 10. Because this is, remember, from chapter 9, the argument that picked up in chapter 8 about meat sacrificed to idols continues on in chapter 10 with this section in chapter 9 saying, hey, the important thing is giving up your freedom for the sake of the gospel. And he says in verse 23, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things edify or build up. Let no one seek his own but each one the other's well-being. That's where Paul is going with all of this. So back to chapter 9. 
Paul is going to ask them to give up their rights. For them, it was the right to eat meat, sacrifice to idols at the idol's temple. They thought, hey, Paul, we've got the right to do this. And Paul's saying, yes, you might. You might understand that there's no such thing as a, as a false god. There's no such thing as an idol. But there's some people that don't have that kind of understanding. There's some people that don't have that knowledge. So out of sensitivity for them, why don't you just give it up? And we use the, the comparison. I think the natural comparison for us is something like alcohol. A Christian, does a Christian have the right to take in an alcoholic beverage? Yes. The Christian does not have the right to get drunk, but I can't tell you from the Bible that you don't have the right to have an alcoholic beverage. But if alcohol, if someone else that you're, you're fellowshipping with doesn't have that freedom because they have a deep conviction growing up in an alcoholic family, seeing the damage it does, they say, I don't want to touch this stuff. Do you, can you, will you say that for their sake, I will never touch alcohol again? Or do you say, well, my right is, I have a right as a Christian, but if you have that right, do you actually have the freedom to give it up as well? And that's where Paul is hitting the Corinthians. So he's going to talk to them about how he has given up his rights. He's not going to ask them to do something he hasn't done himself. But to show them he's made certain personal sacrifices himself, he's going to have to show that he had certain rights to give up. How many of you understand that you can't give up a right you never had in the first place? Yes, that's clear. So Paul has to defend his rights, and to defend his rights, he also has to defend his apostleship. Let me give one background piece of information on this. Paul had a very tenuous relationship with the Corinthians. Remember, the, the book started with them saying, hey, some are of Paul, some are of Apollos, some are of Cephas. They were divided over teachers, and there was a group in the Corinthian church that just did not like Paul. They did not think he had a valid ministry. They did not even think he was truly an apostle like Peter was. And this group has begun to challenge, evidently in Paul's previous uh, communication with them, they've challenged Paul's right even to tell them what's right and wrong. They've challenged his very apostleship, his ministry to them. And so that's where Paul starts with verse 1. He says, am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? These are the first three of 19 rhetorical questions in this chapter. 27 verses, 19 questions. He's just pummeling them with questions. Now, these are questions that don't need an answer. The answer is written into the question. In other words, when Paul says, am I not an apostle? The answer is yes, Paul, you are an apostle. They should have known he was an apostle. Am I not free? Yes, Paul, you are free. How can you say you gave up you know, freedoms if you weren't free to have them. Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? You know, there, were, uh, there will never be apostles today like there were in the days of the early church. We have apostles. There's people that come on TV, and I'm apostle so-and-so, and I'm apostle so-and-so, but not in the same way that the apostles were apostles back in the times of Jesus. One of the requirements for apostleship, and, and by the way, you know apostle just means one who was sent out. So Paul was an apostle in that he was sent out by the church to go do ministry, sent out by the church in Antioch to go and spread the gospel. But he was also an apostle in the same vein as the other apostles because he had seen Jesus Christ. That was the requirement in the early days of the church, in the book of Acts, the requirement to be an apostle is you would have had to have spent time with Jesus. Now there's nobody on TV these days that has ever spent time with Jesus in that way, individually, personally, personally practically, materially. Now, we spend time with Jesus in other ways, but that Paul says, I saw the Lord Jesus. When did he see the Lord Jesus? On the road to Damascus, when Jesus came to him. So when he says, if that's not good enough for you, if I am not an apostle to others, maybe there were others that were, you know, could not claim Paul as the one that planted their church or would not claim him as an apostle, but he says, you guys in Corinth, doubtless I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord, a seal is like a signature. It's something that guarantees authenticity and ownership. And Paul looks at the Corinthian church. Well, he's not looking at them. He's writing to them. And he says, your existence, the fact that you got saved, I couldn't lead you to a Christ I didn't know or wasn't serving. So the very existence of the church, the fruit, was the very proof of his apostleship, his authority in their lives. And I, I could go on to, again, to uh, further prove that, but we're moving on. 
So that satisfies him in terms of it validating his apostleship. Now that he's got that validated, now that he's got that uh, laid in front of them, he says, now, verse 3, my defense, or my apologia, where we get the word apologetics, to those who examine me is this. Do we have no right to eat and drink? Do we have no right to take along a believing wife, as do the other apostles also, the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working? So he's been forced to be put in a place of defending himself. Don't you hate that when people are scrutinizing you and now you're forced to sort of defend yourself? Well, he's under scrutiny. That's what it says. Those who examine me, those who are judging him. And it's a very legal kind of term to be brought as a witness for interrogation. So Paul's life is on trial in front of these Corinthians, at least a certain part of them. The anti-Paul group has said, well, we don't believe Paul has these rights. And in some ways, they were misunderstanding his behavior. See, Paul had chosen to live a little differently than some of the other apostles. And they were interpreting this as if he lacked the rights, but instead Paul had chosen not to enjoy them, not to uh, partake in them. So they're judging him, and he says, here's my defense. Uh, Don't we have a right to eat and drink? Now, that doesn't mean they're trying to get Paul to fast. He's not speaking of just eating and drinking. What he's saying is that when he's ministering to them, doesn't he have a right to eat and drink at their expense? When we invite guest speakers, people coming to Calvary Chapel from California or wherever, we take care of them. That's part of hospitality. And it's, uh, it's, it's our privilege But it's their right. If we invite them here to come and minister and they're coming and they're serving and they're teaching all day Saturday at a conference or coming to a men's retreat or a women's retreat, then we want to make sure that they're taken care of. And that's what Paul's saying. Don't I have the right when I come and minister to you to be taken care of by you? Do we have no right to take along a believing wife as also do the other apostles? So whoever these other apostles are, evidently they had a practice of taking along their wives and uh, traveling with their wives, that their wives would also be taken care of. And Paul says, don't I have that right too? Even though Paul was single, see, Paul had the right to be married, but he gave up that right to be married. And evidently, some were challenging him on that. But it's not just the other apostles, it's the brothers of the Lord and Cephas. You know Jesus had brothers, right? And sisters, half-brothers, we would say. Paul doesn't say that, but same mother, different, uh, Jesus had the same mother, but a different father. So the other brothers were of Mary and Joseph. We have a couple books of the Bible. James was written by a half-brother of Jesus, as was the book of Jude. And evidently, as they traveled, they took along wives with them. And Cephas, Peter, he was married as well. Jesus healed his mother-in-law. What a great act. As a, as a, as he healed Peter's uh, mother-in-law. What a great act to have uh, happen. You uh, provide for the healing of your mother-in-law. That's a good thing. It's a helpful thing for family reunions Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working? So they, Paul's saying to them, I have a right, like the others, to refrain from working. There were four ways, if you were a traveling speaker, there were four ways of being supported. Number one, you could charge a fee. Number two, you could be pro- provided for by a patronage. In other words, someone would take it on themselves to support your ministry, an individual or family. You could beg and you could work. And so it was very common for churches to support those that were traveling. Even Jesus had support from those that were traveling with him, from the women who would provide for his needs, his food, and and whatnot. But evidently, Paul, working for a living, you know, for the Greek mind, working was a, a lower thing. You know, you were a slave, you worked. If you were wealthy, you had slaves that did the work. So as a, as a Greek, you were only uh, real valuable if you could avoid working. That was manual labor was not for the upper class. And so evidently Paul's choice to work was an embarrassment in a way to the church. Remember when he came to uh, Corinth? He worked with Priscilla and Aquila as a, plying his trade as a, a tent maker. And they misinterpreted that as him not being valuable enough. I, when I first started in a trade, the funny thing is, is I learned right away from the guys that had been teaching me, he said, Steve, when you start working, you have to make sure you charge a lot. Really? Why is that? I mean, I would think charging less would get me more business. No, no, no. It's the opposite. If you don't charge enough, people think you're no good and they won't use you. But if you charge a lot, people will think you're really good. They won't figure out you're not until after you work for them and by then you've cashed the check. But there's this funny correlation behind 
what we get charged for something and how valuable we perceive the ministry to be or the, the service to be. And that seems to be what's happening there. They also talk about, a lot, about taking along a believing wife. And, and this was a point of contention. And, I, and I'm so thankful that uh, there are times in, in my ministry where I get to enjoy the presence of Helga coming along on our Israel trips and we get to minister together to the flock. A real blessing. But Paul, living single, said, hey, I've given up the right to travel with a wife. And then he gives some real practical examples. Look at verse 7, just giving them very natural examples. He says, look, Corinthians, whoever goes to war at his own expense. And how many of you were in the military in here? If you were in the military, just raise your hand. Now, now you didn't have to support yourself. The government provided for a wonderful set of clothes for you. They all, it all matched perfectly. You didn't go to war at your own expense because you weren't fighting for yourself. You, you know, you, the person who calls the war has to provide for that. So nobody goes to war at his own expense. And Paul's saying, look, I'm in a spiritual war on your behalf. That's what he's saying. I'm fighting for you a spiritual battle. And then he uses an example of a vineyard. Whoever plants a vineyard and does not eat of its fruit. I mean, if you're going to take the time to buy the seeds and plant the vines and nurture the vines and cultivate the vines... You do this because you're sort of looking for something in return, right? There's an expectation that labor brings reward. No labor, no reward, labor, reward. And that makes sense for the vine dresser, for the vineyard owner. You plant vines because you want grapes. Or, he says, let's talk about shepherds. Who tends a flock and does not drink of the milk of the flock? So the guy who becomes a shepherd, he likes sheep's milk, evidently. So he expects that he takes care of the sheep and the sheep take care of him. It's a reciprocal relationship. And that's what Paul is arguing, again, arguing for his rights to be supported in the ministry. It's so funny, this section. Paul's going to spend 14 verses arguing for the support that he deserves from the church just so he can say, I don't want it. <laughs> it's really kind of an interesting line of reasoning. So he says, do I say these things as a mere man? In other words, am I speaking to you just on a, on a human level, on a natural level? Or does not the law say the same thing also? So they might say, Paul, that's shepherds and vineyards and war. That all sounds great, but that's not the Bible. So Paul says, okay. Uh, he's assuming that their next line of reasoning. He says, okay, the law, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, they say the same thing. For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. That's Deuteronomy 25, verse 4. And then Paul adds to that. He says, is it oxen God is concerned about? Or does he say it altogether for our sakes? Then he answers his own question. For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he who plows should plow in hope, and he who threshes in hope should be partaker of his hope. So the idea is, again, labor and reward. He says the law talks about oxen, and oxen treading out grain. You would use your ox to drag a big stone over the wheat or the barley, and it would separate the, the wheat from the chaff, and then you could... Go ahead and winnow it. And the ox, it'd be cruel, Paul is saying, if you put a muzzle over the ox, because there he is. It's like having to work at Dunkin' Donuts with a muzzle on yourself. I mean, it'd be nice to, to partake of some of those donuts. Or maybe some of you are going, yeah, the muzzle is going to be necessary for me if I work at Dunkin' Donuts. So this poor ox, it's kind of cruel. He's working and working and working and never gets to actually put his head down and grab a mouthful of grain while he's working along there. Now, Paul says, interestingly, do you think God wrote that because he cares about oxen? And the answer is yes, but he cares about people even more. And, of course, the uh, fellowship of oxen in ancient Israel is not reading this and going, hey, oxen owners, we demand our rights. We deserve to be eating from what we're, you know, oxen can't read. And so they're not reading this and going, hey, we demand our rights. So Paul says, hey, obviously it's about more than just oxen. He says it for us. He says it to you and to me, the person who comes and does work on your house. They deserve to be paid when the work is done. The person who labors in ministry deserves to be compensated for the ministry. This is a challenging situation. Anytime we get involved with money, money makes all things weird, doesn't it? Money makes things crazy, and uh, there's been so much abuses, and we'll get to some of those discussions in a minute, but uh, Paul's just laying the groundwork for the support of those who labor 
That's what he says in verse 11. If we have labored or sown like a gardener, like a, uh, an agriculturalist, a farmer, if we have sown spiritual things for you, is it a great thing if we reap your material things? So we've come to you, we've dedicated our lives to bringing spiritual things your way, nurturing, teaching, loving, truth. Therefore, uh, because we've given our lives for that, then is it, a, is it a big deal to expect that you would then provide for our material needs? If others, verse 12, are partakers of this right over you, are we not even more? So the challenge is, and I think what Paul is facing, is that others like Peter, like Apollos, other guest speakers and other traveling pastors that have come through, and even some that are there in Corinth, have been enjoying their rights. They've been enjoying the right to eat and drink at the church's expense. The church would take care of them. They've been enjoying traveling with their wives. They've been enjoying being supported in general. This is the, probably the most comprehensive uh, passage on the, the teaching of supporting those in full-time ministry. And so Paul says, if others are enjoying this, if, acting, if the act of planting gives you the right to harvest, then the act of plowing gives you a right uh, to enjoy the harvest. Now, Paul says, nevertheless, we have not used this right. Because Paul was single, because he had a different philosophy, a different approach, he says, we have these rights, but now he begins. You think he's going to move and transition now, but he's not ready yet. He says, we've not used this right, but instead we endure all things, lest we hinder the gospel of Christ. So he's willing to live at a lower level, at a different level, because he doesn't want anything to hinder the gospel of Christ. Maybe you've noticed, especially if you've come from a denominational background, have you noticed, does it stick out to you that we don't pass an offering plate? Did anybody notice that? Did that seem odd to you at first when you first came here? Well, I don't have anything, we wouldn't have anything against a church that passes an offering plate. There's nothing wrong with that. But when we started the church, we knew that there were some other churches going through building projects. There had been a lot of talk about money within the church. And there are many people that say, well, we don't go to church because church is only concerned with money. So we said, you know what? We don't want that feeling and that sense that the church is only about money to hinder us from teaching people the word of God. So we said, you know what? Scrap the plates. And we put boxes in the back. And that way, it's like we don't want to uh, confuse people to make people think that the church is just about money. So it's just a decision we made. Do we have the right to pass the plate? Yes, we do. But do we have the right not to? Out of sensitivity for where people are in terms of their understanding of church and finances, you bet we do. And that's why we made that decision. Another interesting uh, decision that we made is some of you know my wife, the pastor's wife, uh, she doesn't do children's ministry. She doesn't do women's ministry. She does construction ministry. So she was the contractor for building this church building. Now, what you may not know is that we faced a, an ethical dilemma as she took on the role. Very naturally, she's very skilled at it as you look around and see the wonderful building that God has given us through much of her influence. But uh, now here's the pastor's wife coming on as the building project uh, overseer and coordinator. Well, she certainly would deserve to be compensated for that, wouldn't you agree? But we chose not to. So she worked and served for an entire year full time in the building of the church building. Many people volunteered, but she worked and, and did this for a whole year full time with no pay for this reason. And I say that to say that each one of us in our lives, we have to figure out how the word of God affects our daily decision-making process. So we read things like this, we understand the dilemmas, we understand the confusion and the abuses, and we say, you know what? For the sake of the gospel, so no one can point a finger, Let's just, let's just do it for free. And she did. Because Paul says, we don't want to do anything that would hinder the gospel of Christ. And then before he moves on, he says, oh, wait, I got two more examples that are actually better examples. Verse 13, he says, don't you know that those who minister the holy things eat of the things of the temple? And those who serve at the altar partake of the offerings of the altar. So whether you're Jew or Gentile, you understand that you take sacrifices to the temple. There are those that serve full-time in temple ministry, whether you serve the pagan gods or the god Jehovah. And then part of the sacrifices that you bring, the food or the money or whatever it is, it goes to support those that are serving that god full-time. And it goes back to the Old Testament. God had set it up for the priests and the Levites that people would bring their sacrifices, so people would bring their tithes, and the Levites and the priests would be supported from the tithes and the offerings and the sacrifices of the people. Are you with me in that? 
And so Paul says, hey, this is, these are great examples here. Even so, verse 14, the Lord has commanded. Now he brings it to Jesus. Even so, Jesus has commanded that those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel. And I would cite to you Matthew chapter 10, Jesus sending out his disciples to go take the gospel out, heal the sick, and, and cast out demons. He says to them, don't carry a traveler's bag with a change of clothes and sandals or even a walking stick. I mean, leave your luggage at home. Don't hesitate to accept hospitality as you're traveling because those who work deserve to be fed. Now, that's Jesus' words. But Paul was not willing to take that right. He did not want to be, and he was in a place to not be supported by the church. Again, single guy, didn't have family requirements, didn't have those kind of expenses. He could live a little sim more simply, and so he could support himself by working. This is what he writes to the Thessalonian church. He said, surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardship. We work night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preach the gospel of God to you. Working by day, preaching by night, that's why he says, we've not used this right, but we endure all things lest we hinder the gospel. Much more difficult life that Paul has chosen. Much more difficult life of self-sacrifice that he chose to do. It's harder to live how he's chosen to live. But he says, verse 15, but I have used none of these things, nor have I written these things that it should be done so to me, for it would be better for me to die than that anyone should make my boasting void. He says, look, Corinthians, don't think I'm telling you this because now I want you to support me. I'm not boo-hooing because you don't support me. I'm not trying to manipulate or coerce you into supporting me. It is quite the opposite. I haven't written these things that you should support me. In fact, I'd rather die than make my boasting void. What boasting is he talking about? The boasting of being able to present the gospel free of charge. Watch as we read on. He says, for if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yes, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. He says, look, I'm, I'm preaching the gospel, but I can't boast about it. It wasn't my decision. It was God's decision. God called me into this. I mean, Charles Spurgeon, wonderful pastor, uh, instructor, mentor, had a, had a school of, of ministry students. He's got a wonderful book called Lectures to My Students. And in that book, he says to his students, look, if you can do anything else with your life, by all means, do it. But if you can't imagine doing anything else, then maybe you're called to ministry. It's not a job. Nobody's in it for the money. At least you shouldn't be in it for the money. Paul says, if I preach the gospel, I can't boast. It was an inner compulsion. I was compelled to this by God. Necessity is laid upon me. He says, look, yes, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. Paul says, money or no money. It's never been about money. I'm preaching because that's what God has called me to do, and that's what's in my heart. Woe means death. death. Paul says, I would die if I didn't get to preach the gospel. I don't care if you pay me or not. It doesn't matter if there's one person here or a thousand people here. You know, getting into ministry myself was a really interesting and kind of a neat road for me because I came into ministry uh, having worked with horses and the church started with me working for the first year and a half, two years, full time. And as the church grew, it became obvious I had to make some decisions because I had two full-time jobs uh, and a couple of kids at home and a wife to take care of and just really being stretched very, very thin. And the elders at the time said, look, Steve, the church needs you. And it was hard. I had to pray. I just remembered this uh, between services. I remember sitting with the elders of the church and saying, I, I need you to pray for me because God's going to have to change my heart because I still like doing the horsework that I do. I mean, I love teaching the Bible, and I told God, Whatever, I'll teach the Bible all day long, every day, but don't make me be a pastor. We see how, how that worked out. Don't ever tell God you won't do something. <laughs> but I prayed because I knew what God was doing in my life, and I prayed, said, guys, you got to pray for me for God to change my heart. And guess what happened? God changed my heart. Pretty soon I couldn't imagine not being involved in ministry. This is where my heart was. And so this brought in the challenge of now being compensated for something I enjoyed doing for free. And it was a, an uneasy transition, and I'm very thankful that this church still sees fit to support, through your giving, support those that are doing all the work of ministry. You know, you guys are a lot of work. Just look next to you. There are a lot of work. 
But it's, it's a, we love, but this is what shepherds do. You know, be diligent to know the state of the flock and look well to the herds. But we do it and do it thankfully and gladly. And you all, out of kindness and generosity, make sure that we are free to do this full time. And it's a joy to do it. And that's what Paul's saying. I, don't, I can't boast about this. I have to do it. For if I do it willingly, I have a reward. But even if against my will, I've been entrusted with a stewardship. What is my reward then? Paul, why do you do it? That when I preach the gospel, I may present the gospel of Christ without charge, that I may not abuse, abuse my authority in the gospel. That's Paul's great concern. Paul's great concern is taking away any barrier, anything that might prevent a person from coming to know Jesus Christ. He says, I do this, I do this, I want to present it free of charge. Remember, it's that same passage, Matthew chapter 10. This is what Jesus says to those same disciples. He says, as you go, proclaim the message, the kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons, freely, listen, freely you have received, freely give. That's what he tells his disciples. Look, what I've given to you, I've given to you freely. You didn't have to pay me for the spirit. You didn't have to pay me for the word. So when you give it out, give it out freely. Don't charge people for what God gives them. Do you know, you've seen, haven't you, the abuses that have led to people walking away from church? I feel like I spent half of my life defending God from the church because people have been abused and we see it on the news and whenever there's something that happens, the news loves to highlight the corruption and, and abusiveness. And it's existed throughout time. Think about Hophni and Phinehas, the sons of Eli in the Old Testament, those two corrupt sons. They didn't love God. They were just doing a job and they were in it for what they could get out of it themselves. And you know what happened because of that? People hated going to the temple or to the tabernacle to worship God. And to this day, we still have the same thing happens. Because of corruptions, because of liberties, because of abuses, so many people have rejected a God they haven't known. They've been given a, a selfish view of, of a God who wants to take from them. How can we preach a gospel of a God who wants to give and love by being selfish and unloving ourselves. We, ha we can't preach a sacrificial gospel without living a sacrificial life ourselves, And that's what Paul is saying. Freely you have been given. Freely give. Shepherds are not supposed to fleece the flocks. They're supposed to feed the flocks. But again, we've seen so many of the abuses in churches and pastors living in lives that they shouldn't be living and taking advantage of, of people. I mean, selling healing, selling, even in our history, selling indulgences in the, in the uh, old days of the Catholic Church, heartbreaking and just flat out wrong and unbiblical. I, I hope you can become a defender of God. That when you meet someone, oh, I've, I've, you know, church is this, church is that, it's full of hypocrites, full of problems, and, you know, it's like, I, I know, I know, I know that's there. But let me tell you about who God is. Don't judge him based on what you've seen some that claim to believe him say. Paul says, look, now he's, he's, changing, he's changing courses now. He's showing them that I've had all these rights, yet I've chosen to give them up. He says, for though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win the more. And to the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law, as without law, not being without law toward God, but under law toward Christ, that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became as weak, that I might win the weak. And here's his philosophy. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Now this I do for the gospel's sake, that I may be partaker of it with you. You might say, okay, Paul, this is a great principle. You know, people need to support their ministry, and that's all fine and well. But I think in this section, Paul widens the scope a little bit. This section certainly applies to you and I, giving up certain rights and freedoms to make sure that other people get to hear the good news that you've benefited from so much in your life. We have friends that are missionaries all over the world. I was speaking about Heather and Bond out there in, in Kathmandu and in India. And if you've never been to Kathmandu, which most of you probably haven't, it's an extremely polluted city. So most people walk around with face masks on, with dust masks on, because it's so dirty. And they've chosen, our friends, They've chosen to say, you know, we're going to give up the comforts of a, 
nice house, two-car garage, kids playing sports, going to good schools, all that stuff. We're going to give up that right. And we're going to go to a place where we can't even breathe clean air. And we're going to minister the gospel to people that really need to hear about Jesus. That's sacrifice. David, in, in the Old Testament, said when he had a chance to be given, he, he tried to be given this plot of land, and uh, he said, you know what, I don't, I'm going to pay you for it because I don't want to give to God that which costs me nothing. Paul widens the scope. We get an insight into the philosophy of ministry. And it's a philosophy that comes from Jesus. Jesus didn't come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom to, to many or for many. So we see Paul saying, look, wherever people are, that's where I'm going to go. I'm going to give up my freedom to build my little shell. You know, Christians, we spend too, many, too much time building walls instead of bridges. We have our, our kickboxing for Christ and our yoga for Christ and our our soccer club for Christ and our football club for Christ, and we have all this stuff for Christ. And Paul's saying maybe we need to give up our, 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 our athletics or our, our, our Christian-centric things so we can go and be in the, where the, the rest of the world lives, in the, the recreational club where there's non-believers. And how much of your life do you spend rubbing elbows with non-believers? I mean, maybe work. You might work with a lot. But Paul's saying is your intention is to say, you know what, I have the right to have my kids in this school. But imagine the thought of saying, you know what, I'm going to put my kids into an inner city school that doesn't have a good reputation so they can be a ministry to those people. Now, again, I'm not saying you should do that, but I'm saying this is the kind of radical thinking that to us we go, wait a second, I have to have my life all boxed in and ready and good. The thought of giving up a right for the sake of others, and I'm not saying you should do that with your kids, but maybe it's you. Maybe it's a neighborhood you choose to live in. Maybe you choose to live in a, a lesser neighborhood so you can be a witness to your neighbors. These are radical, aren't these radical thoughts? But this is the kind of guy Paul is. And look, he says, I become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. That's his concern. I do this for the gospel. That's his ultimate concern. Forget about my freedom, he would say. There's people dying. There's people that are living without light and without truth. I like it in this translation. The New Living Translation says, yes, I try to find common ground with everyone, doing everything I can to save some. I do everything to spread the good news and share in its blessings. Maybe you noticed out there uh, where our kitchen is, there's a sign that says common ground. Did you notice that? Next time you go out, look, it's over the wall there. It says common ground. We took that from our office that we used to have uh, down in Palmyra, right next to the BP station. It's now a uh, budget electric that was where we met for Bible studies and praise practice before we had a building. And it was set up like a cafe. And the idea was from this verse that uh, we called it Common Ground because we wanted a place where we could, as a church, interface with the community. And that was that place. People would stop in. Hey, is this a coffee shop? No, but while you're here, glad you stopped in. What is it that you have in your life that you can build a bridge with. Paul said, you know, when I'm with the Jews, I eat kosher. When I'm with the Gentiles, I don't worry about eating kosher because food doesn't mean anything to God. He did say, by the way, he, does say, he did say, when I'm trying to reach those that are without law, then I'm like one without law. Now, wait a second, Paul, what do you mean? Paul's not meaning that, you know, when I'm with the youth group, you know, I've heard of youth pastors trying to be relevant to their youth groups by smoking marijuana with them. That's not relevant. That's just stupid and, for now, illegal. Paul's not saying I'm going to sin so I can reach the sinners. But he's saying where I can build a bridge with somebody, Jesus was a friend to sinners. Where I can find a connection. You know, take those things in your life. You meet somebody at the gym. Hey, we're at the gym together. We got a connection. Hey, we're on the ball field together. You like soccer. I like soccer. There's a connection there that builds a relationship, that leads to a conversation, that talks about a life, that talks about an influence in a family of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul says there's, we need to be where people are that need to know Jesus. Verse 24, now he gives them uh, one final bridge to build to them, one final example, and he talks about if you're going to give up your rights, that takes discipline, doesn't it? Because they were arguing for their right to eat meat, sacrifice to idols. Hey, it's all right. We're going to eat this. 
Paul says, well, it may require you to exercise some self-control, some denial. Maybe it's the same way for alcohol for somebody. I may have to exercise self-control and denial of myself. So Paul gives the example of, of running in a race. Do you not know, verse 24 says, that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize. So he says, Corinthians, look, you need to run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate or self-controlled in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. He says, look, you might say to me, Corinthians, you might say to me, Calvary Chapel, Fluvanna, we hear you about self-control and sacrifice and giving up your rights and your freedoms and all that, but I'm not sure we know how to do that. I'm not sure we're there yet. And Paul says, oh, no, no, no. You know exactly what I'm talking about because I've seen you do it. And he brings in the aspect of athletic competition. Now remember, the Corinthians, Corinth was on the Isthmus of Corinth. It was a little tiny land bridge, and they had the Isthmian Games, much like the Olympic Games. It was the Olympics every two years, and people would sacrifice. And you know, you know what Olympians have to go through to compete in the Olympics? I mean, number one, they're self-supporting. Many Olympians end up going broke and declaring bankruptcy because their dream costs them hundreds of thousands of dollars in time and money. And then not only that, they have to practice and train for hours. I mean, have you ever read what Michael Phelps does to train for swimming? 12,000 calories a day. And you're saying, well, I must be an Olympian. I'm, I'm putting away some calories. By, I'm, a, I'm an Olympian. But then he trains a lot of hours too. In the, I mean, they give up so much. You say, well, look, I'm going to compete in this thing. I recognize that that is going to require me to live a certain way. And Paul's saying it's like we're competing for the gospel. We're competing for souls, not competing with each other. He says, he doesn't say run to win. He says the kind of way you should run as a Christian is the way that someone would run when they really wanted the gold. Do you, do you live your Christian life like you really care about getting gold? I mean, I go out on my bike. You guys know I like to ride my bike. And I go out there, and, and I am not in the running for winning the Tour de France. Can you agree with me on that? I am not uh, ready to go win the Tour. But every time I hop on my bike, I ride as if I'm in the Tour. It doesn't matter that I am or I'm not. The point is that I give it everything I've got. My dad used to tell me, Steve, if it's worth, anything worth doing is worth doing well. But unfortunately, Paul's criticism of the Corinthians, Paul's challenge to them is that we really don't take that approach toward our Christian lives. We do other things. I mean, we know families, we know what we sacrifice for athletics. I mean, we drive hours here and hours there and it's money and it's time and it's morning and it's evenings. We give up all kinds of stuff to pursue athletics for our children. Or as adults, we uh, spend hours and hours and hours training for a run or a race or a this or a that. And, and that's, Paul's not knocking that. I like Paul because he likes athletics. But the question is, do we have that same intensity, that same approach, that same sacrificial idea when it comes to our Christian lives? He said, look, everyone who competes for the prize, they're temperate in all things. No one gets into the Olympics by being lazy and out of control. You might have the freedom to go enjoy that party, to go smoke that thing or drink that thing or do that, stay up late and get up early and play video games all night. But I'm in the Olympics. I don't have that freedom. I got a goal, and it's much bigger than that. It's much bigger than, it's a big thing. So Paul's saying this is the approach to our Christian life. Everyone who competes for the prize is temperate or self-controlled in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. How much more for us as Christians when you win that Olympics in their day, you got celery to wrap around your head. And it transpired into laurel wreaths or whatever they had. Whatever it was, it was vegetation. And vegetation becomes compost. We know that. We've established that. You don't go around wearing, you know, wilted leaves on your head. And people, ooh, look at you. I had a chance to see in person an Olympic medal. I worked for somebody that had won an Olympic medal, silver, I think two silvers and a bronze or something like that. And so I walk into the place and, and I see the medals out there and I'm expecting, wow, Olympic medals. And I looked at them, it was from the Athens, and, but I was like, you know, I was like less than impressed. For all that went into winning that thing, I was like, oh, there it is, it's a little medal. And now life continues on. In, the, in, in heaven, the streets are paved with the stuff. It's a perishable crown, but we, what we do, listen, church, 
What we do has eternal reward. And Paul is begging them to make the comparison. And he wraps it up and he says, Therefore I run this way, not with uncertainty. They had accused him because of his sort of a chameleon approach to life. Wouldn't you say that? He had sort of a chameleon, if I'm with this group of people, then I'll connect with them. And if I'm with that group of people, I'll connect with them. They could say, well, Paul, you're fickle. You're fickle and, and you're, you're inconsistent. But Paul says, absolutely not. Here's, when I run, I don't run inconsistently. I don't run with confusion. I run with certainty. And when I fight, I don't fight randomly as beating the air. He's very predictable about what he's doing. He says, I discipline, continually discipline my body and bring it into subjection. That's to, to beat up, to beat black and blue. Could you say it about yourself? I beat up my body, black and blue, make it obey me. My body is not going to be my master. My bodily desires, my, des my internal longings are not going to be my master. Paul says, I'm going to, like an athlete, I'm going to beat my body into subjection so that, or lest, when I have preached to others about sacrifice, I myself should become disqualified. Paul loved his ministry. Paul did not want to do anything to jeopardize, to abuse, to hinder either the gospel or his own ministry. We look around the world at, uh, let's just look around the church at pastors that have fallen into adultery. One, I've seen wonderful ministries get taken down because of a lack of self-control. I remember when the news about General Petraeus broke when he was involved in that affair. I thought, here's a guy, he's an army general, probably one of the most disciplined people on the face of the earth, and yet lets his guard down in one area for one minute, and it ruins his career. Lance Armstrong, we all know about him. Let me give you one more example. How about Rosie Ruiz? Anybody know who Rosie Ruiz is? Are you still with me for a few minutes here? She's a marathon runner. Turns out uh, in, in April of 1980, good old Rosie appeared to win, appeared to win the Boston Marathon with an incredible time of two hours and 31 minutes and 56 seconds. It would have been the fastest female time in the history uh, of the Boston Marathon as well as the third fastest time ever recorded in any marathon. I mean, this is groundbreaking, earth-shattering. They asked her <laughs> why she didn't seem fatigued after the grueling race, and she said, well, I got up with a lot of energy this morning. What she failed to mention is that she entered the race from the crowd a half mile before the finish line. She cheated. And cheaters never win. She did temporarily, but uh, people had noticed that she hadn't been on the course, and for a variety of reasons, they discovered her cheat. And, uh, and what Paul is trying to say, and what I'm trying to say to you and I, that in ministry, in life, there's no shortcuts. There's no shortcuts. The way to live the Christian life will involve self-sacrifice, denial of some things that uh, even maybe you have the right to do but choose to give up for the sake of others. How many people have you won to Christ recently? When's the last time you were able to lead to cross a barrier, a cultural barrier, a racial barrier, to share Christ with somebody? If you can't remember a time when you've done that, I want to challenge you this morning. There should be lots of new people coming here each week because you've invited them, because you've crossed a barrier. Are you with me, church? Let's pray. Lord, as we close out, I pray that you take these things and just apply them to our lives, that we might have this heart of Paul, heart of the Spirit, Lord, to, to let nothing hinder, no abuse of rights, no corrupt thoughts, Whatever we can, Lord, we know uh, and we pray for this lost world, for those that still have yet to know and understand the importance, the, the only way of Jesus Christ. Lord, have your way in us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. All God's people said.